Hi, Greg Perry, the Historic Preservationist. Welcome to the Shivers House Museum. Uh, this will be a little a snippet teaser of the uh, Salem City Yuletide Tour coming up on December 4th from 1 to 6 p.m. Uh, remember, this is a drive. You're at the drive from Salem to, to Historic Woodstown for this tour. And uh, also remember, masks are required to come into the Shivers House Museum. So come on in, take a step back into history. In doing so, you're also going to see the earliest colonial tavern in the state of New Jersey, the sign of the key tavern, 1669. So let's take a look at uh, Samuel Shivers House. So as you see, we just came through a Dutch door. It's one of very few in Southern New Jersey uh, with original hardware. Uh, it's had multiple other hardwares put over over the years, but the original door. Now, welcome. This is the grand reception house of S Samuel Shivers. And I must introduce something. We have, we have the doctor, he's doing a cameo. He's been in the closet, so to speak, for, oh, a couple years now. This is Dr. Sage Franklin. He's uh, taking uh, he's taking some refuge here on this nice sofa. This nice silk fabric but he looks good there so he's uh he's waiting for the holidays to come but nevertheless welcome to the grand reception room uh this room is paneled in cedar one of the very few in southern new jersey that we know about that survives the shivers house built in six, uh, 1723 the central portion of the house um, timber frame and it is astonishing and amazing there's no words to exemplify how few timber frame houses going back to the early 18th century. Absolutely amazing. Um, the house has gone under a sympathetic restoration by myself uh, in the last several years. Uh, in addition, as I said, we have cedar on the walls. Um, very few houses have that. And uh, we'll take note of the ceiling. These are wide planks. I don't know if we can pick it up with a camera. These are all hand planed. And take it up, they're full length. These are not pieced together. These are the original 1723 timbers on the, on the ceiling here. Imagine getting that up. Um, as a wood crafts person, it's difficult enough to get a half a length of board up there, let alone these full length boards. I understand they would have had a couple people, but nevertheless, it's still very difficult. Um, this is a, a mantle that was put in somewhere in the 1750s. Uh, it's a it's a back-to-back -back fireplace. We're going to see it in the other room and uh, brought a master carver in at the time. At the time was a master architectural carver. And, and look at all these stop flutes and, and these, these, uh, these holes he's put in. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, so just a beautiful mantle. And they also did the entablature coming in the door. So we have the raised panels over the fireplace. We have a painting from the uh, ex extended Shivers family of Samuel Shivers here, um, somewhere in the 1760s. Uh, the room is outfitted with period and reproductions. We know from the diaries what was in this room. So this room and the entire house, museum, uh, Sage Franklin, uh, the entire house museum is decorated in somewhere around 1770 to 1775. So you're seeing very upscale furnishings. British, of course, because Shivers was a mercantile. He had a lot of money, he's an importer made several trips to France and to England. So when he was over there, he always brought items back. And uh, he was connected to the Philadelphia furniture trade and the Philadelphia clock trade. So, uh, so let's, just, let's just go around the room for a bit. We'll just see, just, I'm just gonna briefly explain, everybody can see when they, when they come. Um, you know, a lot of clocks from London. So Shivers had these clocks in place in the 1770s in this house. So we have a penny moon there. Um, this is a, a clock in Tiger Maple, a long case clock. We have a wonderful bracket clock on this pier table. We have a marble pier table. And just take a look at the carving on this. Absolutely astonishing. Hopefully we can get it picked up uh, by the camera. Absolutely astonishing. And these normally would have been done in pairs. And uh, the sofa is something I've made uh, a few years ago. It's a reproduction. We have Scala Mandre fabric. It's all done in natural materials, hog hair, horse hair cotton batting, and uh, we have a looking glass from London in the late 1770s, uh, a walnut long case clock I have made 35 years ago. And uh, 
Adorning the front of the sofa here, we have a uh, period Chippendale tea table from London, 1770s with a tea caddy. Wonderful chair, period British chair. Heavy French influence down at the foot with a, with a scroll, such as in Thomas Chippendale's book, The Director. Scalamandre fabric, complete with some candle wax that's dropped over the period of time, the several, last several years. Some beautiful London uh, walnut broke clocks. We have another one flanked on the other side of the fireplace. And uh, and here we have a, a secretary uh, somewhere in the 17, uh, you know, 1701, 1705. Uh, wonderful walnut bracket clock in a beautiful armchair of the British style. Foot warmer under the tea table. And as many of these houses, you can imagine, this house built in 1723, these are not the original floors. These floors, who knows, were placed 150 years ago. These floors flat out would have been worn out, absolutely worn out. So they've gone to very narrow timber. And uh, another, uh, this is a reproduction chair from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I've copied, I built this chair and upholstered it. Uh, canthus leaves flowing down the cabriole legs, termination in a nice ball and claw, Philadelphia ball and claw. Um, a building corner cupboard, again, 1750, early 1750s when the fireplace was done, the corner cupboard was made. And uh, we have a, a, a dwarf clock or a granddaughter clock, an actual period clock from London, a very um, valuable asset in the Shivers House collection of horology. Uh, so that's a general overview of the grand reception room. This is where you would have impressed your guest. I mean, and keep in mind going through that doorway over there, that part of the house was added on 1813. This is the original Shivers house, 1723. Um, so it was comprised of this grand reception room. You want to impress your friends. Who were some of the major players that came through this, this doorway? Casper Wister of Alloway's Town. Who did, why did he come here? He, come, he came to meet, um, Dr. Benjamin Franklin here on two occasions, 1750, early 1750s, talking about land deals, talking about cooperation of expanding the glass factory down in Alloway's town. And also William Franklin was meeting with Shivers because Samuel Shivers was uh, given land by the king to basically be a real estate broker here. So uh, William Franklin, an avid investor, came to Shivers to talk about investing in West Jersey here. So. Very interesting stuff happened here. But Franklin was here, and uh, so this is actually in the Shivers Diaries. We have 12 volumes of the Shivers Diaries given to us by extended family members. So it's invaluable to know what inventories, what pieces of furniture and decorative arts and accessories were in this room at the time, and who walked through, through that door, and what was, the, uh, what was the ambience of that day. No different than looking at the diary of, of Franklin when he was in, uh, in Paris around the Eiffel Tower. He was the first to watch the Montgolfier brothers' balloon go up. That was the first time man has left the earth. And we would not know that without Dr. Franklin writing it in his diary. And that diary is in Greenwich, in England now, in the Royal Observatory, the Marine Observatory. So, Nevertheless, crucial pieces of information to help us put this dwelling back the way it should have been, the way it was. So to teach anyone that comes through the door to help them better understand the history of West Jersey and South Jersey as we call it today. But let's take a quick look in here. We're not going to spend too much time in here. So you would have had in the original Shivers house, you would have had the one major room. And this was a keeping room, so to speak. The keeping room is a room where um, the, the Shivers would have, they would have stayed in this room. It was a small room. Remember, these houses were difficult to keep warm in the summer. Um, but let's not forget, we have a front door and a back door, cross ventilation. Why do we have a Dutch door? We got horses, we got animals out there. So when we open the doors up, uh, we don't want the animals coming in. So we can get air and the animals come up to the door and so forth and so on. But the keeping room is a place where the family could kind of snuggle in on winter nights, fireplace here. Uh, you don't have to burn a lot of wood. So after you're here, after dinner, you may, you may actually eat your dinner here because there was no dining room, there was no kitchen. The summer kitchen was out back, which is, is an archeological dig at this point. Is just remnants of the foundation. So this would have been where all the living was happening. Whether you had one kid, 12 kids, husband and wife, it happened here. And there's a, a great fire back here. 
somewhere in the 1740s and 50s, the Shivers family had a, uh, a small side business, Sheep and Shears. Sheep and Shears is actually cast into this fire back. So it tells the kind of business. You can't see it now, but there's a sheep on there, and that was their business. They had a plethora of sheep. They had some 400 head of sheep behind the house, and they would cut the sheep for the wool. They were selling wool for insulation in some houses and obviously to weavers. So um, just a great little artifact to the house. This is um, original raised paneling here. Um, this was done in walnut. We have this side, this side of the room we may be able to see, and it's done in pine. It's to simulate walnut. So here, where everybody's viewpoint is, even if you had brought, but normally you wouldn't bring guests in this room. This was a family room. But today we're portraying it, um, it's been portrayed as an office sometimes and we're you know, shifting the venues in, in, uh, in the service museum um, to, to give people, to show the different artifacts that could be found in the house, different pieces of furniture and things like that. But today we're showing the General Washington. Uh, these are deaccessions from museums and uh, the Dr. Benjamin Franklin here on pedestals. So that's what we're showing now. Um, and we have a tall case clock here, musical clock, plays three tunes, London in 1776. So uh, that gives us another just notable feature here. When we walked in, we talked about the boards on the ceiling. Here, there are no boards on the ceiling. This, that was a great expense. Timber was a great expense. You had to cut it, dry it, plank it. Um, so here was a family affair, and you would have just been whitewashed with lime. And so that's, that's pretty much the extent. And we can actually see some pegging up there coming through the beams. Um, this old mortise and tenon, obviously, hand-hewn with a, with a broad axe. So uh, it's a lot of great stuff going on here. We have plaster walls in this section of the house, large strap hinges with pintles. Um, the doors are all, all three major doors in this house are absolutely superb, original doors. So let's uh, take a walk into uh, the, the oldest part of the house. And uh, the oldest part of the house is not actually the oldest part of the house. This, as we said, was the house. This is Shiver 1723. So by 1726, Samuel and his wife have two children. And obviously upstairs, there's only two rooms. So not a lot of room for the kids. So his father, John Shivers, who built the oldest tavern in uh, the state of New Jersey, located where Route 40, Route 45 intersect in historic Woodstown, New Jersey, just 1.8 miles from here. He built a tavern there. He was sent over by the king. John Shivers was. Samuel Shivers is the son. John Shivers passes away during the time when Samuel builds the house, and Samuel Shiver needs more room for the kids. The property, the tavern, is shut down when John dies, and the will to Samuel, Samuel has, what do I do with it? He disassembles the tavern, and he has three Native Americans and four oxen, and they sled drag it up here, and they, they label it and reassemble it here. And for a few barters and, and a few little things with the Native Americans, they actually reassembled this room. So the oldest tavern in the state of New Jersey was moved 1.8 miles, reassembled to, to Samuel Shiver's house. He doubles the size of his house, literally for a couple hundred U.S. dollars today. So that's a deal. So... Uh, Going under a total restoration, we were able to find the cage bar. The cage bar was dismantled um, with a lot of other moldings and things like that. It was sold in 1946 by an owner who uh, literally almost destroyed this house by putting several bathrooms in and things of that nature. And uh, so she, she packed all this stuff up and she sold it to somebody and he was going to put it in the house. It never happened. And soon after the house was acquired, uh, I got a note from the gentleman up in Maine saying, oh, I have this, this uh, you know, these artifacts, this cage bar in a box and several moldings and wainscot and things of that nature. And would you like to buy it? So sight unseen, I bought it, drove up, brought it back for a couple thousand dollars. Um, cage bar was in terrible shape. It was kept in a basement in and in a box in a crate and had a lot of black mold. So uh, just total sympathetic restoration. Maybe at times a little more than a sympathetic for that, but in order to save it. So come on through and let's experience the oldest um, tavern, colonial tavern in the state of New Jersey, candlelit, as it may have been. I think we have a little more candles than we would have had then because candles were a very expensive commodity. So come on in. Enjoy the ambiance. And uh, Actually, Shivers had a, a lot of money. Even John Shivers, remember that. 
taverns. Taverns were a place for people to meet, the churches, the, the local militia, whoever was in charge, whatever militia would have meant here. You would have gotten your mail here, whoever was in the cage bar. And uh, so some very, very important stuff. So life, this is where people were, were, were living in southern West Jersey, and, and they would have, may have never met any other family members. They were in a farm in the middle of nowhere, miles away, and they just know who's in their family. So to come into this tavern, even in passing through, to change a horse, to have uh, some porridge, to have a hard cider and ale, coming here, this was a meeting place. This was almost a bar, a disco. I mean, it could have been many, many things called a public house back in the day. So very, very crude. We had the wagon scoat. Um, wainscoting on the bottom, and the uh, wagon scoat is what, how I refer to it is it would have been like the sides of a wagon and laid against the wall just to protect the wall from, from all the ruckus that would have been going on in this room. People throwing chairs back, a lot of drunken brawls, and they would have had a time where they would have just cut everything off at the end of the night because there's two rooms upstairs, two accommodations were in this tavern. Um, one, one was on the very low end, and uh, you would actually sleep on the floor, you know, for, for uh, just a couple pence, you sleep on the floor, you get a burlap, burlap blanket and uh, very little heat. And then the main room upstairs would have had a, a, a large bed of the day. And uh, there could have been five or six people sleeping in the same bed and you, you would have met someone new that night. But it uh, been quite cold, but at least you would have been over where the fireplace is. You would have had a little bit of heat. So kind of strange times, but... Uh, and remember, this was an, these were outposts. These were, these were placed every eight, nine miles because your horse really couldn't go that much further. Whether you're on a horse, pulling a wagon, you could change a horse, you could board your horse out back. Initially, this was the back of the tower. Would have never had windows. When this dwelling was brought here and made it up with the Samuel Shiver's house, they put the front in the back and the windows here to, to make it architecturally similar in the front. And they did a, they did a wonderful job. But... Here we are recreating with um, cupboards, corner cupboards, candle molds, tavern tables, uh, Windsor chairs. These chairs were just whatever chairs they could find to put in here. Uh, the lighting, a small settle. Uh, we even have a, a, a visit by Dr. Benjamin Franklin here. He's, he's uh, you know, looking at this key and the kite in the sky. And, and Ben, which is phenomenal here, Ben was uh, hanging out on Broadway. And in 1976, the play 1776, and for many years, I don't know, that play may have ran for 10 years, Ben, when they opened the curtain on Broadway, was sitting on the stage. So, and he went into some recluse retirement somewhere in antiquity, an antiquity shop, and uh, he's been in several places, and I found him, I did a restoration on him. So, uh, he's, he's looking a bit better now, but it's, it's good to have the doctor, because he was once in the house back in the 1750s, so it's good to have the doctor back here, and uh, he'll be... Uh, giving everybody a hello. But uh, we have a very early 30-hour clocks, pre-1700, from England. And again, it's in the diary that John Shivers brought a lot of furniture for the day. I mean, a lot. Two, couple, couple clocks over, and he put them in his tavern. People who never had seen a clock in their life, they would never know what that mechanism is. It's probably very scary, to, especially when they hear the bell. And people couldn't even tell the time on there. And one-handed clocks, because... If you could tell time, you probably didn't know what a minute was. We have no conception of time. time. Queen Anne mirror. Um, and here's the cage bar that's been refurbished, and it was just in, in horrific shape. Uh, when the house was, uh, you know, being restored, this window was inside the wall. Somebody had sheetrocked over it, and now it's been brought back to life, fully restored. Uh, and this, this here was a pass-through. So you, in the other room, which would have been the first room coming into the tavern, you would come in. And you would place your order for food, and you'd have, uh, could have been a Native American, it could have been a slave, and they would have been taking your order, and someone would have been cooking. It's like Horn and Hard Art in Philadelphia in the 1950s. They'll pass your meal through, you would have had a server here, and you would have had someone operating the cage bar. Can the meal, put the meal to the table. And probably would have had about 10 chairs in here. People were a lot smaller, it was a very tight atmosphere. So, uh, beautiful Welch dresser. And uh, some periodic pewter, what it may have been available in the day. But we have another uh, another tall case clock, British, and uh, again out of oak, English oak, English brown oak, warm, romantic English brown oak. Single hand again, uh, beautiful dial, lovely little clock. And in England, these were called cottage clocks in the day. So 
come into the opening room, or the first room of the tavern. And uh, let me just get a light here. Um, excuse me for a minute. I'm going to get a light into the, uh, into the hearth so everyone can see the hearth. Simple. So we have an 11-foot wide hearth here, and we have uh, herringbone bricks in the back. And uh, traditionally, this would have been here a wonderful tiger maple, long Pennsylvania long rifle, but uh, everybody has to have one of these. They're so absolutely so gorgeous. But plaster walls, plaster over the brick on either side. Sometimes uh, you would have found that these would have been exposed brick. But let's start over here. The original front door came with that purchase of the cage bar in Maine with a lot of the architectural accoutrements. Original, original hinge and pintles, okay? Original door. It's, uh, we're not going to see the outside of this door today. Original lock. I have not restored the lock yet, but uh, uh, we still have a few more restorations to do in, uh, around the door. Um, for lack of a better word, call it a molding. It's not quite applied yet, but we're getting there. The door is on. And... Uh, you can see the, these are the original uh, floor joists up here, all hand-hewn, and, and, and at some point somebody actually put up plaster on here, but it would have never been done in the day. And you can see all the nail holes. But look at the sides. This is first, um, the, the first technique or the first uh, time of timber framing, the premier time of timber framing. So, and you can tell it by the, the width. These are four inches, four and a half inches by nine inches. Massive, massive timbers. So these timbers are all hand-hewn with a broad axe. Um, so a lot can be said about you know, the, the size of timber. So when we go to the second tier, which the Shivers house, on the other side of the wall, we were just in, the timbers start to shrink. And while we get to the 1813 edition, which um, will be for another time, or the video, um, things get even smaller than Somewhere around 1850, they went into a balloon type construction that was kind of reminiscent, not totally, what we call two by four construction today, and uh, really standard stuff. And that's sawmills across the country, everybody adapted a standard. But uh, so these are people using a broad axe and a hewing axe going down, walking down on the, the tree and creating these, uh, you know, these wonderful uh, structures to support the skeleton of this house. So we have a, uh, a wonderful t table here. It's actually somewhat of a hutch table. The top tilts up. We have a little set tea table here, again, tilting top. Just a melee of chairs, some pewter objects on the table, but we have full accoutrement of over 75 various uh, original 18th century cast iron cooking utensils here. And in the future, we're gonna offer uh, meals here at the Shivers House. Uh, uh, you know, maybe two or three times a year. So we can maybe accommodate 12, 14 people for, you know, to benefit the, uh, the care and uptake of the, of the property. So um, in the wall behind the hutch, small secret stairway that goes up to the upstairs. The stairway is literally this wide, 18 inches wide, and there's a door, but we have the hutch here now. So you have to pull the door and you can walk up inside the wall to get up. So that was to get a quick access if there's some ruckus going on up in the bedrooms at night, if somebody's having a problem. So the owner of the tavern would have gone up there. Remember, a lot of times women ran the taverns because they were found, found to, to keep households much better than men. Men are always out killing things and animals and people back in the day and, and hunting food and, and being farmers and all the things men do, right? And some of that's never changed today, as we know. But the women... Particularly, um, you know, if, if a gentleman was running the tavern initially and, and he passed away and his wife was, or, or they would look for a woman who was a widow to come in and, and make her the owner of a tavern or to pay her to be the proprietor of the tavern to take care of it. So women played a crucial role in the maintenance of these kind of, uh, these kind of establishments. So, and uh, she would have always, again, had slaves or, or Native Americans possibly or possibly children to the lesser extent taking care of this. So you would have come in the front door. This was a fur, Indian fur trading center initially. You would come in and you would, uh, we have, hey guys, we have, we have a little bit of a cat fight here tonight. Sage Franklin has some competition with one of the older members here. But um, anyway, you would come in and you would trade furs here. You would buy furs, trade furs, trade fur coats and things like that. That's how this property started out as an outpost of a tavern to stay at, to change horses and things like that. Someone would be sitting here, maybe the proprietor, 
proprietor may be sitting in the cage bar, may have someone else. And you say, well, do you want to eat? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the one meal, we have one meal cooking today, do you want it? And for one price, you could have your drink, your meal, and if you want, you could, you could go upstairs and spend the night. So uh, capability upstairs of maybe 12 individuals, um, that's pretty much standard. So uh, let's see if we have anything else here to look at. But uh, the, floors, the floors have been refinished in, in the tavern. They're white plank floors. They were in such god-awful shape. Uh, so had to go on to refinishing. Just want to name a few pieces here. This, uh, it's in the diary that uh, John Shivers brought over a bench. And this is a bench uh, from actually taking from the cathedral in Salisbury, England, the actual cathedral there. And it says right here, 1707 is, is, is engraved in the woods, 1707. And this was from Salisbury, England. So when they were doing a, a stylistic change in the Salisbury Cathedral, they sold off all the pews and benches. And this is one of them. So John Shivers, and one of his first treks over before he opened the tavern, brought, him, brought some furniture over. Um, these bu bucolic uh, plate holding racks and the, the hanging corner covered for the pewter. Uh, and, and this cupboard were acquired here in, this, in the southern New Jersey or West Jersey area. And they were, you know, brought into the tavern and in an inventory somewhere around 16, uh, 1668, 1669. So you've had time, he's had time to put some American or co American colonial pieces of furniture in here. And uh, so I think that uh, kind of wraps us up. Um, we hope everybody uh, comes out and sees us for the Salem Yuletide tour. This is going to be the 4th of December from 1 to 6 p.m. And... Uh, just remember a couple things. You must drive here, so just plan it. I mean, if you've seen some of the other sites in Salem in years past, uh, you may want to bypass a few, but I want you to see them all. So take the entire day. There's plenty of time to see all the sites. We have great churches, great homes on Market Street and some other side streets, Oak Street in, in Salem. But remember, the Shivers House Museum, strictly mass. Don't you know, we don't want, don't want you to waste your time to drive here and think you're going to walk in without a mask. And we have too many people say they're vaccinated and they're not vaccinated. So we don't want to go through that. We don't want anyone to get infected because coming into the, the museum here. So um, there are the rules. And uh, some other things about coming here to the Shivers House Museum. Uh, no food, no drink. Can't say you're not eating or drinking. Nothing in your hand. Nothing comes through the front door and you're not allowed in. And uh, no children under eight, period. Any other children must be attended closely by an adult. We've had too many problems with uh, children sitting on uh, some of our fabric. Some of the fabric in the museum here goes for eight, nine hundred dollars a yard. Um, we've had kids with candy in their mouth and they drop candy, uh, kids holding babies, and we're not going to go for it anymore. So um, have to take a hard line here. We put a lot of time to try to recreate history or not recreate history, but to bring back what was originally here for everyone else. So we just don't want a few to destroy it. So we just have to play by the rules here. So. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Greg Perry, the historic preservationist. Um, we hope to see you then and uh, come support a good cause because, you know, we're promoting history. We're not promoting just Shivers House, but we're promoting Salem City, one of the oldest colon English, original English speaking colonies in the New World here um, in West Jersey. So uh, very, very important. And, and, and I'm sure you know, I mean, History is not a top priority um, on a lot of people's agenda today. Too many people have their heads so buried deep in their phones and their internet. It, it does mean, doesn't mean anything to them. And hence, the kids don't grow up with any sense of history. So uh, we're trying to make this available, and I'm working with the, the Yuletide Tour, and uh, we hope to see you then. Greg Perry, the Historic Preservationist, signing out. Thanks for uh, taking a tour of the, uh, this wonderful dwelling in the candlelight.